so I already had a short introduction in the first panel. So I'm going to be focusing uh, not so much on this kind of backgrounds of how we came together with the Yushanyak to really uh, dive deep into the, the this tourism and redefining nanotourism, but I would like to, to speak about the current situation and then just open up some issues that we could discuss or advocate for. The title of my short contribution is called Towards New Realities. In this presentation, I would like to open up probably a quite utopian position related to the current new global situation within the COVID-19 pandemic. Could be now, um, as we are somehow forced to uh, fundamentally question uh, our consumption and transportation principles, not only in relation to our food or fashion, but also to tourism. As we know that habits and systems don't change immediately, we could at least, I think, try in the coming months to really find some key parts of this particular economy, the tourist economy. Um, as COVID-19 um, tries to redefine the new normal, can we try to seek for a little better in certain aspects of the new normal? It's a utopian version, but I think we would just like to rethink it and then question it. I will start with a very specific place and a project that we did together with the students. It's called, titled Town as, Town as Dispersed Hotel Bahale Nistria. It's a very specific place in Croatia um, where TU Vienna uh, have been invited to contribute to a novel forms of tourism of very particular stone built town of Bahale Nistria. Its municipality area has been an intriguing challenge and an opportunity to engage two main issues simultaneously, tourism and the countryside. Uh, the countryside in relation to the cities has been neglected as a focus of architects and end planners for many decades. The preoccupation with the problems and potentials of the city excluded rigorous research and response to the highly transformative realities of villages with their surroundings. Uh, even the loud pro proclaimer of the city in Paul has then started to declare the urgent need to readdress the countryside and we have seen just the opening of the major exhibition at Guggenheim titled Countryside, Future of the World. In the outline of the COVID-19, the countryside got another spotlight as we realized that all more rural um, countries are dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic in a much better way because it's extremely urban related and density related um, healthcare issue. So in order to reach potentially wider influence on a global scale, we wanted also together with the TU Vienna continue to act in a bottom up, up manner both in the city and in this case in the countryside with this nanotourism, which was mentioned before at the beginning, a participatory and locally oriented bottom-up alternative to the conventional tourism. So why is Bale so specific? Um, this is a unique cultural heritage. Um, it has never had this kind of um, specific and crucial predefined conditions uh, as the Bale they have, long lasting, Sustainable development of the town and its surrounding was a carefully curated agenda of the local municipality. And this was actually an exception on the coast of Croatia. We have to also maybe mention here that what we will experience now or are we experiencing now in the Adriatic Sea or the Mediterranean is something that Croatia has been experienced in the time of the Yugoslav Wars, where the tourists were, were actually afraid to come and there they had the opportunity to rethink tourism. Mostly they completely misled and actually from what it was defined in Yugoslavia, they actually over uh, populated, over densified uh, mass tourism uh, further after the Yugoslav wars. But actually in the case of Bale, they somehow, the local community opted for another alternative. 
So they didn't want to develop fast. They didn't want to sell the land. So this is a, a town which is not on the, uh, on the coastline. It's 10 kilometers inwards. But actually how they managed to, to formulate that is that the, uh, the community, they opened a new local economy. So all the residents of this country, countryside village became stakeholders of a company providing touristic accommodation, first with offering just kind of a camping site on, on the beach, and then later on offering more permanent location for touristic accommodation. So this economic model furthermore generated grounds for everyday needs of its population, such as kindergarten and similar facilities. And all these interlinked processes proved to be unavoidable for any relevant development of the countryside for tourism. So they are now in, um, the residents of this village are actually now in the, 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 the state that they don't need to pay for kindergarten and they have a brand new sports slash cultural hall built. So basically it's a very unique and special situation. Uh, it's, um, it's a village that it's half empty, but it's actually very much defined with the stone um, in its, oh, this is the overwhelming characteristic in all possible formats and applications. So it's visible on a first glance on these narrow cobbled streets and within the fortified walls. What is exactly also true is that this is, it's half empty, this village, and therefore this kind of, uh, the concept of Albergo di Puso was somehow suggested to be rethought um, on that kind of to be retested and re-researched on the town itself. Um, it was created in uh, this common principle in Italy, was created in the 80s, um, and actually was always linked to the abandoned villages in the first case because of the earthquake. So, what we have started with the students to look into is how a common strategy with the different groups could somehow redefine um, uh, the buildings uh, which are empty, the blue ones, and the existing ruins um, into collectively uh, promoting a new dispersed hotel and kind of building upon the identities of this Vale Vale, which are the stone ruins wine and the valleys as the identities. I will just browse through just somehow to understand on which kind of urban but also architectural level we try to work with the students in order to establish a very different uh, ways of uh, creating new touristic opportunities for this specific local economy in, in this particular village. On the other hand, in, in a couple of years later, uh, we were dealing uh, with another context. It was the context of Venice. Um, it was the same time that we were part of Biennale 2016. Um, and actually we wanted to, 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 to question the, the, the Biennale motto, reporting from the front, and we changed it to reporting from the Venice because we wanted to see how, what could we learn from Venice, the, the city without any cars, uh, it could be a laboratory and, and what are the issues that they are facing this kind of um, a, a place where currently 25 million of tourists per year is completely changing um, the, the reality. Uh, Venice has lost its population over the past 60 years and actually today they are around 60,000 uh, residents only and daily visitors, not today, a couple of weeks ago, and three, triple the times of visitors per day. So it's one per three ratio of, of course, this, well, it's not only that it's problematic and crowded, but actually it, it doesn't contribute to a normal um, conditions for living there because there is no, it's housing shortage and everything that uh, Alejandro Aravena was actually asking the, 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 the global community to report from different fronts, but it's already there. And of course, the other reality of Venice, uh, which we already uh, saw this, is this kind of 
response towards the, the tourists, um, the tourists are not allowed. So this was in uh, Venice Biennale 2014. So they call them, say, the, themselves provocatively in this art project, native indigenous Venetians only. Um, of course, um, because this is the, this kind of, um, because this is the fact. And if in Guardian in 2019, uh, there was this article, which is Sinking City, um, this was then the reality um, in, in March in 2019, where actually the, the city is completely empty. So I think uh, what we are looking into are two extremes, uh, either something it's, it's almost sinking because of not only because of the flooding, but because of too many people. And on the other hand, now it's going to be completely empty, but what we should question how it will reopen. Um, of course, no one, for all the young people never saw Venice, even if they were living there or visiting it perpetually in this particular momentum. So the canals are clear, which is evident. And of course, this is also, this new condition became, of course, also an art position of several photographers. Uh, in this case of Marco Panzetti, who is who was documenting with his, his videos from over tourism to zero tourism. So what we are of course discussing if there is any possibility for something in between, which is neither over or or, or zero. And it's of course opening up. Um, I mean this beautiful um, kind of instances which happened, uh, let's say, on Piazza San Marco only if you woke up at 6 in the morning or 5.30 on a summer, a summer day or, um, and that was maybe only possibility to, to see it at least not that crowded. Um, and of course this is related again to something that we started today's discussion. It's um, this call that we somehow declare that nanotourism could be, nanotourist is the one who could involve, participate and become uh, a tourist, a special kind of tourist in, in your own city, your own town, your own street or your own home. And this is what is happening now um, with the COVID. We, here it was an experiment, it was provocation for our research team at the Bayano Bio 50 in Ljubljana, um, curated by Jan Böhm, which I have to state now because we saw him before in the video, Maria. But this was provocation and now it became reality, which we would never even assume so. So, um, and then we are back to the title or the poster for my talk, and these are the cruise ships. And, and why maybe this is a, an opportunity to, to, I mean, it has been written enormously on the cruise ships, but it, I think it's now really an opportunity to somehow uh, really state that maybe European ports, we are not, no longer wishing the, these giants to be allowed to dock on our coast. And I will go through now for the reasons that we should have in the following weeks this position and we should maybe advocate it through the European Commission and, and other institutions which are which could um, somehow press on the port authorities not to allow this any longer. So this is a picture from the same photographer from 2019 in August and what we see uh, it's one of the cruise ships, um, roughly 1.5 cruise ships per day visit Venice in, in this case. And of course, other um, Mediterranean coastal uh, cities similarly. It's actually producing um, a pollution of an approximately 800, 820,000 vehicles. And this is a city without any car. So this is just one of the key issues, not over, over overpopulation, that it's actually, we could be demanding really strict and a fast forward changes. But on the other hand, of course, it's 5,000 to 2,000 people minimum on one of these giants, which means that this is like 100 buses, which if you stop this, this cannot be compared to any airplane mode of transportation to the location neither in, in any instance. So it's really not contributed to the local community. 
But as we see on this picture, these cruise ships are kind of, these giants are that, like poster of what is wrong with the, uh, with the tourism. And of course, with the COVID-19, it's also, they became extremely problematic because of the transmission of the virus. So we could use maybe this opportunity to somehow really look into that and then, and then uh, stop allowing if, um, them to dock. So they are representing this kind of dichotomy of any form um, of responsible or participatory or locally oriented tourism because we, we all know that these are all inclusive and as we also um, saw this, this um, early afternoon, um, there are completely just devastating and not contributing even contributing even to the uh, like with the monetary uh, terms in terms of the euros um, they spend maybe 10 euros per person which is almost nothing so basically um, and for them 60 million uh, fine for spilling and, and, and devastating the waters uh, it's actually presented 0.7 percent of their profit of one particular cruise lining company, which of course they are all registered out of any uh, normal legislative uh, countries. Of course, also the art world um, reacted to that. So that was Vancy in, in Venice. So this has been going on in Venice for uh, unbelievable times. Of course, they tried to stop it through the canals, but nothing, um, nothing helped. Um, so what this is um, a diagram also from Guardian and trying just to show us that of course there is a um, air pollution uh, which is, was even never referred as fine for. So cruise ships were fine for the water pollution but they have never until this moment been fined for the air pollution. And how what we see here is the emissions from a large one large cruise ship compared to the equivalent number of cars. So basically, um, 80,000 cars in, uh, in, ca um, in carbon dioxide, and of course, and, and furthermore, coming to the sulfur dioxide in 376 million cars. So all our other efforts of sustainable travel in Europe, it's irrelevant if we allow these giants to dock on, on the coast of Europe. And of course, these are the most simplistic possible uh, diagrams which have been um, designed by Transport and Environment um, last June, comparing the um, number of ships which are docking into the European ports and the pollution that they are responsible for. So basically, it's really a contradiction that, um, and we know that they pay in super small fees in order to be allowed to be docked into this, um, this port as well. So I think this is a visual reminder that this could be maybe one of the first steps to really go into that particular um, continuation. So this is again the relationship to the uh, 260 million cars of all European citizens compared to that particular, probably the most devastating industry. And of course, here we are uh, related to France. It's not, uh, these are not the cruisers, but it's of course uh, allowing us to rethink the transport of goods, which we, I tried to somehow speak before. But truly, uh, cruise ship industry as the tourism industry is not necessary in any aspect. So just to somehow conclude well, with a couple of, um, just a reminder of, about the nanotourism and being this some sort of creative critique uh, and kind of a bottom-up participatory alternative. Um, I placed it here because also Maria mentioned it before about this relationship going one way or two way. And I think it's really important to somehow uh, integrate the participation which we lack in the cruise, um, let's say cruise ships industry 100% into the future of nanotourism. And just to conclude, I will just kind of jump through a couple of um, hacks which we have done in order to somehow understand the, the potential of nanotourism through other forms of, um, let's say, 
specific design approaches which could be restorative uh, to the crisis in which the, the planet is now. So this, was, uh, this is a definition of critical design by Anthony Dune and Fiona Rady, which we, we hacked in 2014. So they, are, uh, they try to define critical design as the one that uses speculative design proposals to challenge narrow assumptions, preconceptions and givens about the role products play in everyday life. It is more of an attitude than anything else, a position rather than a method. There are many people doing this uh, who have never heard of the term critical design and who have their own way of describing what they do. Naming it critical design is simply a useful way of making this activity more visible and subject to the discussion and debate. So um, how does it read in nanotourism? Nanotourism uses speculative design proposals to challenge narrow assumptions preconceptions and givens about the role tourism play in everyday life. It is more an attitude than anything else, a proposite position rather than a method. There are many people doing this who have never heard of the term nanotourism and who have their own way of describing what they do. Naming it nanotourism is simply a useful way of making this um, activity more visible and subject to discussion and debate. And of course, similar might be said for, um, for another quote, which I will go into. It's a reference to the recent exhibition of Broken Nature in Triennale di Milano, um, by Paola, curated by Paola Antonelli, that highlights a range of uh, international architecture and design projects that underline the concept of restorative design. So, this exhibition highlights objects and concepts uh, at different scales that try to reconsider uh, humans' relationship with their environment, including research into both natural and social systems. And of course, um, this is, a, let's say, a definition or the pretensions of restorative design by both curators Paola Antonelli and Ala Tamir. The, um, which we try to somehow hack um, with the nanotourism. And I will just read, uh, I will basically, we believe the design has inherent restorative abilities and can cater to this displacement of action. Design can provide appropriate mental, aesthetic, and emotional tools required to process and handle key issues of the present day. Most importantly, Design has the much needed capacity to help decipher complex circumstances and take steps toward constructive actions. And of course, hacking this, um, it's, it's very funny because it can read as a proper text, um, but it says, we believe that nanotourism has inherent restorative abilities and can cater to displacement of action. Nanotourism can provide um, appropriate mental, aesthetic, and emotional tools required to process and handle these issues of the present day. And of course, ACT calls you to take to, um, steps towards constructive actions. Um, similarly, could be done uh, with the uh, ecosophy definition but by Felix Gattari, who in, just before he passed away, he claimed in his essay, Remaking Social Practices, 1992, uh, which Paola Antonelli also quoted in, in uh, her Broken Nature curatorial statement. So um, he wanted to somehow offer, um, and I think it's really important to, to somehow read that because it relates to what we are discussing today, uh, rethinking tourism in the planet crisis. By what means uh, in the current climate of passivity could we unleash a mass awakening, a new renaissance? Or we can read this um, question in the COVID-19 uh, condition today. Without modification to the social and material environment, there can be no change in mentalities. Here we are in the presence of a circle that leads me to postulate the necessity of funding an ecosophy that will link environmental ecology to social ecology and to mental ecology. Uh, sorry. Of course, you can do that 
with uh, nanotourism, just to conclude, here we are in the presence of circle that leads me to postulate the necessity of founding nanotourism that would link environmental tourism to social tourism and mental tourism. But what is more important, I think it's the question that he's actually defining that we can only do this um, collectively if we approach it uh, individually and on all these aspects of uh, mental awareness. And to conclude, I'm going to somehow show you um, a very simple um, project also from BO50, which were, was trying to also challenge one very, uh, uh, an important issue which we have been discussing today. So it's trying to redefine, challenge the underused uh, museum as cultural institution, so redefining the museum as participatory platform for exchange. So how to challenge a museum and uh, this underused cultural institution to become a temporary hotel where cultural exchange becomes the new currency. And I think this new currency is really important in trying to rethink the tourism in the future because obviously we were all speaking about uh, the economy and we are rethinking because of the COVID-19 how to reestablish economy. So, um, how to challenge Museum of Architecture and Design at the time of Biennial um, in terms of the underused uh, museum because it's open only eight hours a day in the good, good days in order to become a hotel it would be open 24 hours a day. How to increase uh, participation on three different levels and how to challenge and, uh, and allow something that most museums they don't allow it's the ordinary museum, um, it's please don't touch, and BO50, it's actually allowing you to, to, to touch and change the items. This is a super radical project that um, Alessandro Fonte and Silvia Susana developed uh, in 2014 in Ljubljana. They also challenged uh, the, custom, the issue of customization of your hotel room and how you could do that within that. So before uh, the, the, like the visitors or the tourists of BO50 Hotel entered this space, this was the exhibition space of nanotourism in BO50 at Mao. And of course this looked after, allowing for curatorial change, allowing for the customization of the space and asking the artists not to pay to stay in this room was actually challenging so many issues that they are uh, kind of the norms in the cultural institutions and also the norms of the economy because the, the currency was actually sharing the knowledge as these uh, visitors have to participate within a talk, within an exhibition or with holding a workshop. Uh, they developed, Silvia and Alessandra, the whole platform, the blog, uh, they invited a variety of people from hands-on um, people to artists who completely changed the, the space which we so carefully curated on the first day, uh, first opening days. They, over the course of a couple of months, they had 29 guests from 16 cities in eight, uh, eight countries. Um, and of course, not earning neither one euro, but actually showing how an existing structure could change into the benefits of exchange of knowledge and, 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 and the participatory action from the provider and to the, these new tourists, the non-tourists. And just to conclude, um, to go back to the World Tourist Organization, because this is how we started nanotourism, we checked how they defined tourism back then, but let's see what's the concern of World Tourism Organization um, now and what it was in 2019. So they were so happy that tourism enjoys continuous growth, generating um, 5 billion per day. Um, again, in 2018, international tourist arrivals grew. Total export earnings from international tourism grew by 4% in real terms. And of course, this is also one of the industries which were the least hit at the last economic crisis in 2008 and was somehow benefiting each year until this momentum. And of course, uh, 
nowadays uh, they are scared because um, it's definitely uh, the worst affected um, industry um, and of course this is not just um, allowing us to, to see the clean waters of Venice or uh, cleaner air over the North Italy or China but actually also defines um, you know uh, I don't know millions of jobless people within this sector but the approach of the World Tourism Organization it's really uh, strange because um, they claim continuously, you know, like this marketing model, tourism must be recognized as a key pillar for building a better future in all world regions, as we saw that they were devastating most of them. And of course, this is even uh, more uh, straightforward, saying tourism will be ready to bounce back. Um, and I think um, we have to find a way how it will bounce back, not the way it was, I hope. Um, of course, at the same moment, with the pressure of the World Tourism um, Organization to the EU, um, and of course, of course, trying to secure the jobs for all people in that industry, EU Commissioner Kerry Britton defined that um, a lot of emergency funds will be directed to help in tourism. Actually, one quarter of all the funds that EU is going to release on that. And such an amount reflects both the impact of COVID had on European tourism and on our sector's ability to affect positive change. So what, what is visible here is that there's going to be enormous amount of funding poured into this industry. But of course, if we question this industry, as we also heard that there was a tourism before the industry of tourism arose, we have now the opportunity to do so because the, this change was never financed with such an enormous amount of money as it could be today. Let me just to uh, somehow conclude or um, with this kind of utopian agenda that design um, that I'm sharing the, the position of both Paola Antonelli and Alice Rostorn that design um, is or could be one of the most powerful tools uh, in this current COVID-19 crisis. Um, I see it um, in the perception of the tourism and um, here is just somehow a call from uh, Alice and uh, Paula to somehow, um, to, to somehow for the ingenuity, resourcefulness and generosity of the designers and their collaborators um, to produce innovations that they are helping to protect us from the pandemic and to improve the treatment and to prepare for the radical changes it will introduce to our lives in the future. So I'm just asking as a final slide, can we with this kind of new condition of enormous financial input into the sector um, change the disruptive tourism towards the possible uh, restorative tourism. I'm aware that it's a utopian, but I think we should be questioning it. Thank you so much.